Excellent. Let us pray. Gracious God, once again, we thank you for this morning. We thank you every time we have the opportunity to come before and worship you and celebrate you. Help that to be a part of our daily life, Lord. Lord, as we enter into this time, I ask that uh, either because of me or in spite of me, you bring a message to your people this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned, Pastor Trish uh, was planning to do the service today and was not able to, but she did send me her sermon. So I'm going to do my very best to uh, share her message with you this morning that she's been praying over. Um, over the past seven weeks, we've been learning through play. We've re-encountered or perhaps encountered for the first time some traditional childhood toys and games that have been used to teach us important spiritual lessons. Through things like Play-Doh and Pez dispensers, board games, and Mr. Potato Head, we've hopefully reinvigorated the play centers of our brain so that next time you see those toys, they will now connect you with the spiritual principles like our connectedness to the body of Christ, our moldability when we submit ourselves to God the potter, and our job to share the love of Christ. This week, we come to our final sermon in this series and our final toy, dominoes. Dominoes are a favorite toy in Pastor Trisha's family. They love to stack them, to set them in a row and knock them over. They love to play Mexican train and chicken foot and the myriad of other games you can play with these simple little blocks. Dominoes, like playing cards and dice, are a little bit of a generic gaming device. But these simple building blocks can be assembled in any number of ways to play games ranging from simple to complex. They can be used in mechanical ways to build educational, to build educational ways learning to count the dots or add and subtract. And they can be used in games that require great skill. Dominoes are believed to have originated in China in the 12th century. And in fact, that's where their name comes from. It is reminiscent of a word used to describe a kind of hood one worn by Christian priests in China. There are also some theories of Arabian or Egyptian origins as well. They appeared in Italy in the early 18th century and spread to the rest of Europe soon after, becoming one of the most popular games in family parlors and pubs. Dominoes are still popular today, especially in Latin America, where dominoes is, are considered the national game for many Caribbean countries. So what can we learn from dominoes? Well, let's hold on to that question and first look at our scripture for today. We turn this week to a parable in the Gospel of Matthew, the parable of the bridesmaids. This parable is the second in a series of four parables, all looking at the return of Jesus and the possibility of a final sorting that will take place between the righteous and the unrighteous. This parable is one that is uncomfortable for some. In fact, there are people that would prefer to skip over it altogether. But that's what makes scripture amazing. It forces us, when we let it, to think about things that might make us a little uncomfortable, to grapple with what might make us squirm. And if we sit for just a little while in that uncomfortable place, hopefully we can come out the other side having learned something, having been changed by the process. So that's what we're going to do today, because this is definitely one of those parables that creates a bit of discomfort in us if we're honest. So let's go over the basics. The parable tells us the story of ten bridesmaids, five are wise, and come to the event prepared and ready to fulfill their job, and five are silly or foolish. They come unprepared and come out looking a bit ditzy. The five foolish find themselves unprepared and ask the five wise to share their oil. The five wise decline to share. So the five foolish leave to go get what they need. When they come back, they discover that the party has started without them and are declined entrance. And we're told so, um, and we're told this so it will be, that this is how it will be when Jesus returns. So what do we do with this parable? 
Well, in order to answer that, I think we first need to understand parables in general. I heard someone on the radio yesterday call Jesus the greatest storyteller ever. The radio guest was using Jesus as an example to prove his point that people learn morals and truths best through story, and that Jesus' stories and parables were great examples of this. And he was right. Jesus used stories to teach lessons. He used the story of the Good Samaritan to make the listeners think about what it really means to be someone's neighbor. He used the parable of the prodigal son to teach the listeners about um, God's about the grace that God offers and how that grace works in a powerful way. So each parable teaches a lesson. Parables often have a surprise ending. For example, in the parable of the lost coin, we find a woman who loses a coin, her only coin. She searches the entire house, the whole house, and when she finds it, she throws a party to celebrate. It is a surprise ending. Who throws a party spending the money they spent the whole day trying to find? So, parables are used to teach a lesson. And they often have some surprise endings, something that doesn't quite make sense. Think back a long, long time ago to English literature class. Do you remember learning about metaphors and allegory? Metaphors are a language device used to compare two unlike things. Allegories are stories that have multiple levels of meaning. Metaphors usually have one meaning. The first layer doesn't make any sense, but the second layer has meaning. For example, if you say my daughter's grades went up this term, we know that you mean they improved. Because it's a metaphor, we also know that you don't literally mean her grades ascending to the ceiling. We all know what you mean and what you don't mean. That is not always true with an allegory. Allegories have multiple levels of meaning and it makes sense on all of them. So this story could just be taken literally. It makes sense, even if it's a bit of a weird story, all on its own. But because we know Jesus never tells a story with just one level of meaning, we must look for even more. What we have to figure out is how far do we push the meaning of the parable? Do we have to look for meaning in every detail? For instance, in the parable of the woman with the lost coin, we don't assign meaning to the broom she uses to sweep. But we do assign meaning to other parts of the story. We could go detail by detail, but instead I, I want to think about the overall theme we hear in this parable. This one, this one detail of the five wise having oil and the five foolish not, and what it might mean in practical terms for us. At its heart, I think the parable is about preparedness. The writer of Matthew uses the parable in connection with others to talk about being prepared for the coming of Jesus. He writes to a community who had already been waiting for that to happen for a long time. Matthew's gospel was written some 50 years after Christ, and they'd been waiting this whole time for Christ's imminent arrival, and it hadn't happened yet. So Matthew uses this section of, this, of his gospel to reinvigorate the Christians in his community to prepare themselves to stay alert, to be ready for what's to come. But what does it mean to be ready? What does that look like? Well, we know from reading other portions of Matthew's gospel that for him, readiness meant living the life of the kingdom. It meant living the quality of life described earlier in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. It means forgiving one's enemies and being persecuted in Jesus' name. It means being a peacemaker, not just when life is pleasant, but when hostilities happen again and again and again. It means being merciful even when others around you aren't. That's what being ready looks like. That is how others will know that you're a follower of Jesus. So how do we do that in practical terms? Well, I think we do it just as one prepares a domino train. Piece by piece. One step at a time. Putting one foot in front of another. Have you ever tried to build a really long train of dominoes? 
One that works well because each domino is exactly in the line where it should be. If just one domino is out of place, it stops the whole line. It takes work. It takes time. Sometimes it takes placing and replacing and placing all over again. The same is true with our spiritual lives. Our ability to be peacemakers, mercy sharers, people who exude grace and live a life of forgiveness doesn't happen overnight. It happens step by step by step. It happens in the day-to-day -day moments when in, when in uh, easy moments we can make the extraordinary choice. And by doing that again and again and again, we are prepared to make the extraordinary choice in the extraordinary moments as well. Think for a moment about when you learned to read. Most of us did not do it overnight. We didn't wake up one day when we were five and decide to read Don Quixote or Jane Eyre. We started with the simple, the easy, see, spot, run. We learned the basics of phonics and practiced them over and over so that eventually we get to more complicated sentences and ways of seeing the world like watch the canine ambulate down the concrete causeway. We don't start out with that sentence when we're just five years old. But hopefully, when you've been reading for many years, you aren't still at see, spot, run. You've grown. Maybe some, some days you have, you have to go back to the simple lesson that helped you understand the first sentence, but you use those simple skills to break down more complex sentences. I think the same is true in our spiritual lives. When we are living lives daily with Christ, when we are spending time reading scripture, praying, worshiping, attending to our spirits, seeking God's wisdom, when we are practicing our faith by praying for those who hurt us in small ways and offering mercies to those in need, mercy to those in need, then we are readying ourselves. Let's watch a quick video to help us visualize what this looks like. We're about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino it weighs about 100 pounds ugh, and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. Pretty cool, huh? If you tried to knock over the 100-pound domino with just the one placed with a tweezer, it wouldn't work, would it? It's laughable, really. The same is true in our spiritual lives. When we try to wade through deep struggles in life with only the one inch worth of practicing our faith and wonder why we failed, we're acting like the foolish bridesmaids. We're unprepared. If we want to be like the wise, we have to put our dominoes, our spiritual disciplines and practices in faith, piece by piece, so that day by day, when the hard days come, when the wait gets longer and longer, and the things God asks of us get bigger and bigger, we're prepared for them. Putting our dominoes in order means submitting ourselves, our lives, our decisions to God. It means being in prayer and study because it's wrestling with God's word that changes us. It means being in a community of faith because that's what sustains us. Days will come that feel like that 100-pound domino. Days when we're called to forgive what seems unforgivable. To offer mercy to those who really, you would really rather not. 
There will be days when we can't muster our peacemaking or ability to be merciful on our own strength. Like Christ will ask us to. So we have to rely on the, mo the movement of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I think the Holy Spirit looks a lot like the momentum it took to knock over that big domino. So think about your life. Are you one of the wise? Is your oil lamp full with enough ready for the hard days? Or are you one of the foolish who won't have the momentum to get to the party? We, like the bridesmaids, don't know when things will happen. We don't know when planes will crash into buildings or distrust will crash into our families. We don't know when riots will break out or mental illness will hold us hostage. We don't know when refugees will seek safety in our own backyard or when doctors won't be able to offer any solace at all. When those moments happen, Jesus will ask us to respond in a way distinct from the rest of the world. We don't know when we will be asked to forgive or to share or to be a force for peace, a healing presence. We don't know when Jesus will ask us to work for the good of those who want to harm us and others. We don't know when Jesus will ask impossible things of us, asking us to knock over the Empire State Building with a domino we have to hold with our tweezers. But as long as the world remains broken, as long as we are still waiting for the kingdom of God to be known on earth as it is in heaven, as long as there is still immense pain and suffering in this world, we can be assured that Jesus will ask. One of these days, Jesus is going to ask us, each one of us, to do something impossible. We can either sit back and wait, hoping Jesus somehow overlooks us, or we can begin setting up the dominoes, trusting that when the time comes, the Holy Spirit will blow through, the dominoes will fall, and the, and the kingdom will be revealed. Amen? Amen. Amen.